Hey everyone, this is Eric Steinberg and Mustafa Syed. Welcome to the MRADS video series. Let's go. <laughs> All right, so this guy stumbles into your ED smelling of natty ice and PBR. He comes in complaining <laughs> of right wrist pain and swelling. Status post, quote unquote, making a sweet diving catch, bro. He's sloshed, he tells you his dad is a lawyer, and he won't let you examine his wrist until he gets an x-ray and some pain meds. But he's sober enough to tell you he's allergic to Toradol. So being a provider in a busy ED, you order the wrist film, and he gets wheeled to x-ray. So, what's our differential for fallen outstretched hand, or foosh? What kind of injuries can he have? This video will discuss carpal pathology. So we'll discuss some basic wrist film pearls. A couple of things you should always look at when you look at the film include the alignment of the bones and the arcs, parallelism of the joints, symmetry, basically what the wrist looks like compared to other normal wrists you've seen, certain axes, we'll go into that later, and tangential views. And what I mean by that are views that are 90 degrees to each other so that you can see fracture lines better. So as always, we must know what a normal film looks like before we can see the pathology. There are three arcs we should always be able to visualize when looking at a wrist film. So, the first of these arcs is this proximal red line, which outlines the proximal joint surfaces of the scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrum. The second arc defines the distal surface of the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, and here it's represented by the blue line. The third arc outlines the proximal surface of the capitate and the hamate. These arcs should be assessed on every radiograph that you encounter. The thing to keep in mind is that proper wrist positioning is important. If the wrist is turned a little bit or if there's a lot of ulnar or radial deviation, then these arcs may falsely look discontinuous. So always make sure that you're looking at proper positioning first, then assess the arcs. Disruption of any of these arcs suggests an abnormality at that site and you should closely examine it. The other thing you should really make sure is that the film view is appropriate and the person's hand is not rotated as this can skew your diagnosis. It's also fun to go over the ridiculous names of the carpal bones. One of my favorite mnemonics also in all of medicine. The mnemonic being some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Let's go through it. Scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. Again, some lovers try positions that they can't handle. But some can. Oh. Alright, so knowing the normal, the AP radiograph is usually the easier one for the wrist. The lateral one, as you can see, can be a nightmare to read sometimes. A few things you have to learn to do. One is you kind of have to look through the image and figure out what the bones look like. So we'll go over the uh, basic bones on the lateral. Right here, what I'm outlining is the lunate. Above it, you kind of have to kind of have to glimpse through this. This is the capitate. The scaphoid is along this line and you can see that it juts out on the palmar surface of the hand. And above the scaphoid, what you should look for is the hamate hook. And really you can get better at this by practice. You just have to keep looking at the AP film and the lateral film and correlate with CTs if you have them. Now parallelism is another important concept to grasp when assessing the carpal bones. And I have no idea what that means, so why don't you tell us about it, Moose? The wrist joint is pretty important for rotation. So in order for you to do that, you have to have multiple surfaces with cartilage. And this basically brings up the concept of parallelism. What you notice is that joint spaces don't intersect. If you look right here, the scaphoid and the lunate, the joint spaces are parallel. If you look at the scaphoid and the capitate, the joint spaces are parallel. And then if you look at the capitate and the hamate, the joint spaces are parallel. This is important for the bones to slide over each other in order to have this rotational capacity. Once you lose these symmetries, you know that there's some sort of dislocation or a carpal bone is not in the right place or there's a fracture fragment. Yeah, I knew that. Yes, obviously. This is a better example because on x-rays sometimes the uh, view can obscure your joint spaces. So this is on a CT where you can clearly see that each joint space is separate. You can actually trace it. And you can do this on your own. If you see a CT scan, try to go through the various slices and you'll be able to basically take your mouse and outline each joint space. So let's apply what we've learned so far. So Eric, what do you think about the arcs? Are they normal? So yeah, all the arcs appear to be normal. And all the joint spaces appear to be parallel. But what I do see is a positive arrow sign. Especially on the right, it looks like there's a fracture going through the scaphoid. Now the importance 
of this radiograph is that it's the same person but two different views. You may or may not be familiar with this, but this is the frontal radiograph for the person's wrist in a neutral position. And this is the scaphoid view where the person has ulnar deviation of the hand. Same radiograph, you see a little bit of sclerosis here, which raises suspicion for a fracture. And if you go over to the scaphoid view, you can clearly see that there is a transscaphoid fracture. This is badness. This is what happens when a scaphoid fracture goes untreated. What is that dark spot that the arrows are pointing to with all the sclerosis around it? This is basically dead bone, and uh, this is known as avascular necrosis. Now this occurs because the blood supply to the scaphoid loops from distal to proximal, so impairment of this supply can necrose the proximal portion of the bone, we see here. So in short, the more proximal the fracture, the greater chance of avascular nephrosis and non-union. And on the left side, just to show you, this is the previous fracture that we saw in the film, and you can see on CT how much more dramatic it is. Again, let's apply what you've learned so far. If you follow the, if you follow the arcs, they're intact. The parallelism in this picture can be off a little bit, but that's because the person's hand is a little bit rotated. What I want to draw your attention to is this sclerotic line. Initially, you may blow it off as nothing, but this represents an important concept in fractures. All bones have trabeculae, which are stress lines that run across as a certain pattern. Anytime you see a disruption of these trabeculae, it's an important pattern to recognize because it should raise suspicion for some sort of injury. You need to account for why that line is there. So if you look at this line, and I've zoomed up on it here, this actually turned out to be a scaphoid fracture in the proximal portion. This, this concept is also important in pediatrics. Now this can easily be missed, as we can see here. And this is why in the ER we always tend to splint these patients. We have suspicion for a scaphoid fracture. So let's talk about clinically what raises our suspicion. In any trauma patient, the mechanism of injury is extremely important. It gives us an indication of the potential severity of our patient's injuries. For scaphoid fracture, it's almost always a foosh, a fallen outstretched hand. The scaphoid bone is the most commonly fractured carpal. Findings include tenderness over the radial aspect of the wrist, especially over the anatomic snuff box, as seen in the picture. Also, axial loading of the thumb and pain with ulnar wrist deviation are noted on physical exam. As we saw in the images, these fractures don't always pop up on normal view. So if you're suspicious, get a scaphoid view. And up to 10% of the time, and some people even say, some of the studies I've read even say up to 30% of the time, these fractures aren't even visible retrospectively. And this is why in the ED, we thumb spike a splint, all of the ones we're suspicious for, right? Right. But also consider that another approach is to obtain a CT scan, as these are very sensitive for fractures. You could save the person the inconvenience of having a wet, smelly splint on for a week or two. I know the current practice is that it's acceptable to put the splint on, but think about it. Would you rather they be immobilized or would you rather have a diagnosis? The CT scan is very quick and very effective and incredibly sensitive. And that's a really good point. I mean, we do it for patients who fell with persistent hip pain and equivocal x-rays, so why not with other pathology like scaphoid fractures? Definitely something to think about. And they're also much faster than MRI. So on this lateral film, everything looks aligned, except for this chunk of bone sticking out over here. Well said, as always, Eric. This is a classic example of a triquetral fracture. There are two types of triquetral fractures dorsal from hitting the ulnar styloid, or a fracture of the body, in which case assess the lunate and the other carpals in the arc. The most common fracture you'll encounter is the dorsal type. So let's apply what you've learned. So we'll quickly assess the arcs. All three appear okay. And we're going to look at the joint spaces. And they appear fairly symmetric. But if you look behind, this is the pisiform. If you look behind it, this is the location for the triquetrum. What you see is a fracture line through the body of the triquetrum. If you rotate the hand a little bit to get the pisiform out of the way, again, you can see it much better. But there's definitely a fracture in the triquetral body. Eric, what do you call this? A triquetral body fracture. So for triquetral fractures, common mechanism of injury, again, is foosh, especially in hyperextension and ulnar deviation, or a direct blow to the dorsum of the wrist. On exam, we'll find pain the ulnar aspect of the wrist and decreased grip strength. The radiologic pearls for this would be looking for the dorsal chip on the lateral view. This is the importance of having the 90 degree views because if you only had the AP, you would not be able to see the chip. And for these patients, we splint them in a short arm splint and refer them to ortho ASAP. So, completely normal wrist, right? What? This looks terrible, man. I hope it's not normal. It's normal. Uh, yeah, right. Just on, kidding. On the frontal, everything looks smashed. There's no symmetry. I definitely can't draw the three arcs anywhere.
and parallelism, I'm not even going to try that on this one. I would call this badness. That's correct. Badness. Also, the other thing you should notice, apart from the fact that you cannot draw your arcs and you don't see any symmetry or parallelism, is where's the lunate? It looks like the lunate is shoved up behind the uh, capitate and the hamate. And if you look at the shape, it looks like a triangle. These are important radiographic signs. And this is a result from the lunate dislocating towards the palm. This is your classic piece of pi sign. Here's another lateral. Uh, it doesn't look as good as the, the normal that we saw before. There's obviously bones falling off other bones, and I don't like it too much. So this guy falling off the radius should be the lunate. So it looks like that's a lunate dislocation. You are correct. Here's a diagram to show you what the normal alignment of the bones should look like on the lateral view. Don't worry about the angles and stuff. You're not going to have time for that. Just get the idea that the capitate should be under the metacarpal, and the lunate should be directly under the capitate, and all of these are kind of lined up with the radius. So for lunate dislocation, the mechanism is usually major, a fall from height or a motor vehicle crash. These patients have severe pain, severe swelling, and severe limited range of motion, and they can have something called acute carpal tunnel syndrome because of the impingement of the median nerve. The best way to test for this is sensory is the test for sensation of the finger pad of the index finger. The radiologic pearls for this include the piece of pi in the sky, the triangular shape that we saw earlier because the lunate is out of place and rotated, the spilled teacup where the lunate is no longer sitting on the radius but turned over on its side, and don't forget there's a high likelihood of a scaphoid fracture associated with lunate dislocation, so always look at the scaphoid. And much more often than not, these patients go to the OR for open reduction and internal fixation. More x-rays, yes! Initially this one looks okay. But again, there's an arrow, so something must be wrong. So I'll just take the same approach. When I try drawing that first arc, something's off. But other than that, I don't see too much. But I'll move on to parallelism. The joints between the scaphoid and the lunate look a bit off. And the joints between the lunate and the capitate don't look to be parallel either. So I'm not sure what's going on. Good job. You described everything perfectly. The arcs are off, and there isn't parallelism and symmetry between the joint spaces. And if you compare it to the normal that I put up here, you can see the difference in the shape of the lunate. Look at how it's more triangular, and here it's more of a square shape. And you can clearly see the joint spaces between the bones surrounding it. So let's continue. Here you can see that the lunate is in its normal position on the radius. But from that diagram we saw earlier, the capitate should be located on top of the lunate. And you can clearly see that it's displaced over here. So the CT scan, which is a lot easier to see than the lateral film, shows you that this is the lunate. Here's the radius, so these two are in appropriate position. But look at this capitate, it's mangled. It's, dis it's dislocated posteriorly. And now if you look at the lateral film, hopefully you can get a better idea of it. This is the radial surface, and this is the lunate. It's a little bit tilted, but it's still on the radial surface. And if you look, this is the capitate. And you kind of have to squint to see this, but it's definitely not a line, and it's not on top of the lunate. So this is a perilunate dislocation. Again, going back to the mechanism, usually it's a fouche. Typical presentation of pain, swelling, and limited range of motion. The radiologic pearls include the fact that the lunate, relative to the distal radius, is intact. It stays on top. But the other bones around it aren't necessarily aligned. That's why it's called a perilunate dislocation. And don't forget, there's an association with scaphoid fracture, so always look at the scaphoid. Rarely, closed reduction can be attempted along with your favorite orthopedist, but usually these go to the OR. Eric, you can't miss this one. Hint, it's in the corner. That's a picture of Terry Thomas, and that's got to be the Terry Thomas sign. You got it. This is pathognomonic for the famous scaphoid dislocation. And what you're seeing here is that the first arc is interrupted. You can't, you can't draw it from the proximal surface of the joints. And then secondly, the joint spaces are not symmetric. If you compare the joint spaces of all the other carpal bones, you can see that this one is clearly widened. This is because there is disruption of the scapholunate ligament, and this is one of the earlier signs of a perilunate dislocation. And very similar to a lunate or a perilunate dislocation, the mechanism is a fouche with a hyperextended wrist and ulnar deviation. These patients may present with pain, and even clicking on the radial side of the wrist. They could have tenderness at Lister's tubercle, 
which is a small protuberance in the center of the distal radius that you can find when you palpate your distal radius while you flex your wrist. It's that little bump sticking out. Also, the patient could have a positive scaphoid shift test, which is pain with radial deviation while pressure is applied to the scaphoid tubercle, as seen in the picture. The radiologic pearls for this are pretty simple. There's just a widened scaphoid lunate space, usually greater than 3 millimeters. Treatment. Surgical repair. Can you see a fracture? Nah. Come on. There's really a fracture. No. I'm just kidding. Actually, I don't see one either. So why am I showing you this? This is where a good H&P comes in. What? I know. Who does that? What? <laughs> the previous x-rays did not really show any carpal fracture. But this special view, which is known as a tunnel view, is used for evaluating the hook of the hamate. Whenever there are hamate fractures, this is usually the most common fracture that happens. And as you can see, there is a lucent line going through the hook of the hamate. This would not have been seen on the other views. So this raises the importance of a tangential view so that you can see the fracture lines. So these fractures are rare. They're about 2% of all carpal fractures. Usually they're suffered by a direct blow, although one third of these fractures are actually due to repetitive swinging by golfers. Complications include ulnar nerve compression at the level of the Guillaume Canal. The hook of the hamate is one of the borders of the Guion Canal and is close to the motor branch of the ulnar nerve. So we wouldn't be surprised to find ulnar nerve findings, one of them being something called froment sign. Because the ulnar nerve innervates the adductors of your fingers, if you take a piece of paper and have your patient hold it in between their thumb and their index finger and they're unable to, to hold on to it as you try pulling it out, we know there's weakness in the muscles innervated by the ulnar nerve. Again, that's called froment sign. The radiologic pearls for this include just obtaining the proper view because that's really what it comes down to for diagnosing this fracture. And if you don't see anything on the x-rays, which is very possible, and your clinical suspicion is high, get the CT. And in the ER, we put these patients in a volar splint and refer them to the hand surgeon. So when you take a quick look at this slide, you can assume that there is some theoretical reason to believe that NSAIDs retard fracture healing. And the thing is, animal studies have largely borne this idea. Human studies, on the other hand, don't wholly support this conclusion. While the retrospective studies mostly confirm the results of animal studies, there's only been two prospective studies that have been conducted, and they both reach opposing conclusions. While it may be likely that, in fact, NSAIDs do retard fracture healing, more research on humans is needed. Now, some authors recommend that in the presence of other risk factors, which may adversely affect fracture healing, such as smoking, diabetes, or peripheral artery disease, NSAID use for analgesia should be strictly limited. Alternatives such as centrally acting agents, such as opioids, should be considered in these patients. Good thing there isn't an opioid abuse problem in our country, huh, Moose? I love opioids. So we went over a lot of stuff so far. Let's recap over the basic points. Always know the normal. This way you can identify pathology when it comes across you. Always get tangential views, views that are AP and lateral. The reason being, we may see a fracture on one and not the other. You know when to obtain special views, like a scaphoid view or a rotated view or a tunnel view. And also understand that when the x-ray doesn't show a fracture and your clinical suspicion is very high, it's not bad to get a CT. And always, always, always test for neurovascular status. That's a good motor exam, sensory exam, and test for pulses. Well, thank you guys again for listening to us. I hope you got something out of it. And stay tuned for our next episode, which will go over ischemic stroke. Boom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Is this not why you are here?